Upon hearing her first morning yawn, I feigned handsome, profiled sleep. I just did not know what to do. Would she be shocked at finding me by her side, and not in some spare bed? Would she collect her clothes and lock herself up in the bathroom? Would she demand to be taken at once to Ramsdale, to her mother's bedside, back to camp? But my low was a sportive lassie. I felt her eyes on me, and when she uttered at last that beloved chortling note of hers, I knew her eyes had been laughing. She rolled over to my side, and her warm brown hair came against my collarbone. I gave a mediocre imitation of waking up. We lay quietly. I gently caressed her hair, and we gently kissed. Her kiss, to my delirious embarrassment, had some rather comical refinements of flutter and probe which made me conclude that she had been coached at an early age by a little lesbian. No Charlie boy could have taught her that. As if to see whether I had had my fill and learned the lesson, she drew away and surveyed me. Her cheekbones were flushed, her full underlip glistened. My dissolution was near. All at once, with a burst of rough glee, the sign of the nymphette, she put her mouth to my ear, but for quite a while my mind could not separate into words the hot thunder of her whisper, and she laughed and brushed the hair off her face and tried again, and gradually the odd sense of living in a brand new, mad new dream world where everything was permissible came over me as I realised what she was suggesting. I answered, I did not know what game she and Charlie had played. You mean you've never? Her features twisted into a stare of disgusted incredulity. You have never, she started again. I took time out by nuzzling her a little. Lay off, will you, she said with a twangy whine, hastily removing her brown shoulder from my lips. It was very curious the way she considered, and kept doing so for a long time. All caresses except kisses on the mouth or the stark act of love, either romantic slosh or abnormal. You mean, she persisted, now kneeling above me, you never did it when you were a kid? Never, I answered, quite truthfully. OK, said Lolita, here's where we start. However, I shall not bore my learned readers with a detailed account of Lolita's presumption. Suffice it to say that not a trace of modesty did I perceive in this beautiful, hardly formed young girl whom modern co-educational, juvenile mores, the campfire racket and so forth had utterly and hopelessly depraved. She saw the stark act merely as part of a youngster's furtive world, unknown to adults. What adults did for purposes of procreation was no business of hers. My life was handled by Little Low in an energetic, matter-of-fact manner as if it were an insensate gadget unconnected with me. While eager to impress me with the world of tough kids, she was not quite prepared for certain discrepancy between a kid's life and mine. Pride alone prevented her from giving up for in my strange predicament I feigned supreme stupidity and had to have her way, at least while I could still bear it. But really, these are irrelevant matters. I'm not concerned with so-called sex at all. Anybody can imagine those elements of animality. A greater endeavour lures me on, to fix once for all the perilous magic of nymphettes. I have to tread carefully. I have to speak in a whisper. Oh, you veteran crime reporter, you grave old usher, you once popular policeman now in solitary confinement after gracing that school crossing for years, you wretched emeritus read to by a boy, it would never do, would it, to have you fellows fall madly in love with my Lolita? Had I been a painter, had the management of the enchanted hunters lost its mind one summer day and commissioned me to redecorate their dining room with murals of my own making, this is what I might have thought up. Let me list some fragments. There would have been a lake. There would have been an arbor in flame flower. There would have been nature studies. A tiger pursuing a bird of paradise. A choking snake sheathing whole the flayed trunk of a shoat. There would have been a sultan, his face expressing great agony, belied, as it were, by his molding caress, helping a Calipigian slave child to climb a column of onyx. There would have been those luminous globules of gonadel glow that travel up the opalescent sides of jukeboxes. There would have been all kinds of camp activities in the part of the intermediate group, canoeing, coranting, combing curls in the lakeside sun. There would have been poplars, apples, a suburban Sunday, 
there would have been a fire opal dissolving within a ripple-ringed pool, a last throb, a last dab of colour, stinging red, smarting pink, a sigh, a wincing child. I am trying to describe these things, not to relive them in my present boundless misery, but to sort out the portion of hell and the portion of heaven in that strange, awful, maddening world, nymphet love. The beastly and beautiful merged at one point, and it is that borderline I would like to fix, and I feel I failed to do so utterly. Why? The stipulation of the Roman law, according to which a girl may marry at twelve, was adopted by the church and is still preserved rather tacitly in some of the United States. And fifteen is lawful everywhere. There is nothing wrong, say both hemispheres, when a brute of forty, blessed by the local priest and bloated with drink, sheds his sweat-drenched finery and thrusts himself up to the hilt into his youthful bride. In such stimulating temperate climates, says an old magazine in this prison library, as St. Louis, Chicago and Cincinnati, girls mature about the end of their twelfth year. Dolores Hayes was born less than three hundred miles from stimulating Cincinnati. I have but followed nature. I am nature's faithful hound. Why then this horror that I cannot shake off? Did I deprive her of her flower? Sensitive gentlewomen of the jury, I was not even her first lover.'